We have two Old Testament readings this morning. The first one comes from the book of Exodus. Chapter 23, 14 through 17. Three times in the year you shall hold a festival for me. You shall observe the festival of unleavened bread as I commanded you. You shall eat unleavened bread for seven days at the appointed time in the mouth of a month of Abed, for it is in you and for you that you were taken out of Egypt. No one shall appear before me empty-handed. You shall observe the festival of harvest of first fruits of your labor. Of what you sow in the fields, you shall observe the festival of ingathering at the end of the year. When you gather in from the field the fruit of your labor, three times in the year all your males shall appear before the Lord God. And the second New T Old Testament reading comes from a very short psalm, Psalm 134. Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift your hands in the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord, maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. And I invite you to rise as you are able as we read the New Testament, the ascension of Jesus Christ. Then he said to them, These are my words that I have spoken to you while I'm still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, what the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending you with what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. So ends the reading of the Holy Scripture. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Pray with me. Merciful God. We ask that you open our hearts and our minds to your presence, guide and direct us. May this time be a time of worship and blessing. We thank you, Almighty God, for your presence in this holy, sanctified place. Amen. I want to start with a question this morning. What did you think about on your way to church? As you were driving along, what were you thinking about? What was on your mind? What thoughts came across your mind? I'll come back to that, but I want you to think about it. I'm going to start with an illustration from an atheist, David Foster Wallace. He's a well-known American writer, intellectual, and best-selling novelist until his untimely death. He gave a commencement address in which he said this to a graduating class. And this is from the Wall Street Journal, September 2008. He says, because here's something else that is true. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And pretty much anything you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, 
If they are where you tap your real meaning in life, then you will never, ever have enough. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure. You will always end up feeling not quite enough. And as time and age start showing on you, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power. You will feel weak and afraid, and you will never, ever have enough power over others to keep that fear of losing power at bay. Worship your intellect. You're so smart. And yet, deep down inside, you may feel stupid and a fraud, and you're always on the verge of being found out that you aren't that smart. So ends the quote. I have started out this series of faithful and heartfelt worship with this quote because, believe it or not, who or what we worship will define who we are and what we will become. As Christians, our faith and our worship is to be of God Almighty through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Each of us live for something But if that thing is not Jesus, that thing will fail us. We will be enslaved in some way or another to a life that will lead us to an empty place without hope. I think of the, not all, but many of the people in Hollywood. You know, all the actors and stuff. Golly, they have a tough life. Always striving. Always fearful. Always trying to be better than, to make the front page. Our news feeds are constantly bringing news of lives that have turned away from a life filled with hope and God's righteous living. So much pain and suffering. The latest are mass shootings and war, horrible events. Yet if we come to God Almighty and worship God with our whole being, we will in turn be blessed. And we need to know, we need to know what the scriptures tell us about our worship of God and what and how we need to worship. Now I began by asking you a question this morning. What was on your mind as you came to church? That's important. What were you thinking about as you traveled? Were you thinking about coming to worship God? I would venture to say from my own personal experience that I was not thinking about God when I was coming to worship. I was not thinking about giving thanks to God. I was not thinking about anything that has to do with God until I caught myself. What I was thinking about was these communion trays, the order of worship. Will anybody even show up? And will they think anything of the service? Yeah. Yeah. But I ask you this question, and I think it's very important. Have you ever done anything in life that didn't take some preparation, especially if it's important? What have you done in life that was important to you that you didn't take some time to prepare for it? Anything important takes preparation. And that means if you think worshiping God is important, then you're going to take time to prepare. Now, some people turn off the TV or whatever and have quiet time for a while on Saturday nights. Some people fast. Some people get up real early in the morning and pray on Sunday mornings. But the point here is, if you don't take time to prepare, you're going to miss out on a great deal. 
Because worshiping God just doesn't come flowing out of our heads freely. It's something we have to be intentional about. From my own experience, coming before God in order to worship and preparing for this message, I found that I was preaching to me. So bear with me. We need to look back centuries to the people who traveled in Israel to the temple in Jerusalem as commanded by God through Moses to keep the festivals and worship God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth and all that is and ever will be. Hang on to that for a minute. Our scriptures tell us about the importance of attending worship in the temple in Jerusalem. Travel was difficult and dangerous. To be able to worship God in the temple took great time and effort. It was a several day trip on foot. Not an easy task. Think of all they needed to do and prepare for to walk over 20 miles each way to worship God in the temple. I wonder if even I would walk 20 miles, which is about what I have to come from Colorado Springs up here, to worship. It would probably take me a while. I wouldn't be here till tomorrow. Anyway, you get my point. The Hebrew people made a journey to the temple to celebrate the three main festivals each year. They included Passover, Pentecost. It's not the one we celebrate where the Holy Spirit comes upon the believers and then the festival of Booths. Interestingly, and this is important, two of the main festivals that they celebrated are a very important part of our worship. Passover, where our communion service as a sacrament comes from, and Christ's death and resurrection came from the Jewish Passover. He was crucified. It's our Easter morning. Another connection to the Jewish Passover is the Hebrew people were freed from slavery in Egypt. With Jesus' death and resurrection at the Passion, Christians are freed from our sins and given new life. Passover for us is the coming of the Holy Spirit to work within the souls of Christians, building the kingdom of God. For the Hebrew people, what was the time of first fruits? of the harvest was their Pentecost. Jesus attended all of these. Do you hear me? Jesus attended all of these and he's God. And yet he came to worship. He walked many miles to enter the courts of the temple to worship. Now they traveled in groups for safety and they sang and they prayed the Psalms. These trips of singing and praying were known from the Psalms of Ascent, where they go up to the temple. There are 15 of them, Psalm 120 to 134. These Psalms were sung as they traveled much like we have road trip recordings in our cell phones that we plug in to our radios. I can't do it, but a lot of people do and they plug it into their radios, and they've got all this music they want to listen to when they're traveling. Well, the Hebrew people sang psalms and prayed as they traveled. It developed into a practice by which they prepared their hearts and their minds for worship when they arrived at the temple. What would our worship look like if we were to repeat some of the psalms on our way to church, or if you were to offer a prayer. Now, don't close your eyes, obviously, if you're driving. But what would it be like if you checked yourself and you realized that you're coming to worship the creator of the universe? Psalm 134 is only three verses long, but it's one of those that they use for the psalm of ascent. Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift your hands 
to the holy place and bless, bless the Lord. May the Lord, maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. Now the language, all who stand in the house of the Lord, is the description of the Levitical priest. This is how they were described all through the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, as to how they were to lead worship. The pilgrims, when they arrived at the temple, they were exhausted and weary. It was not an easy trip. And yet, they gathered at the temple. Why? To worship. And they called out to the priests and said, We've been on a long journey. We need you to lead us in worship now. And as we get to verse 3, the response of the priests back to the people, May the Lord bless you from Zion. So how do we approach our time of worship? Do we come with hearts ready to bless the God of creation? Yet the psalm says God responds to his people who come and worship him by returning their worship with blessings. Now, let's take a moment here and think about what you were thinking about on your way to worship. Some of it might be trivial. Some of you may have some really heavy stuff on your hearts. And you're here this morning. But my point is, if we're thinking about those things, we're not really preparing our hearts to worship. And by golly, that's why we're here. Worship needs to be the heart of who we are as a people. We need to worship God. For the Hebrew people, the place where God sat on his throne was the holy temple in Jerusalem. We too are in the presence of the living God when we gather together to worship God is here in this place as we bring our praises and our worship before his glorious and gracious presence. Now this psalm actually calls the priests and the Levites to be in worship all night long. Verse 1 starts with the, in the King James Version with the word behold, which is translated from the Hebrew word meaning hinne which actually means an emphatic call to attention or take heed. Now, what are you to take heed of? To be ready to worship God. The Hebrew people had taken long journeys to Jerusalem just to worship. They worshiped in the midst of their lives, and I guarantee that their lives were a lot tougher than ours. We do have, we have problems, that's for sure. We have things that are going on in this world that really bring us consternation. And yet these people who were under Roman rule and so much, so much, so much they lived through. They had short lives. And yet, and yet the importance and power of their times were so important that even Jesus Christ himself, God himself, went to worship in the temple to model the importance of worship for all of us. I wonder if when we enter the sanctuary, we are thinking about bringing our blessings and honor to God. Now you say, how can I bless God? God's got everything, right? Can you think of anything? Think of anything that its original source doesn't come from God. I'm saying original source. Can you think of one thing? Uh-uh. No siree. That's why we need to bless God. Because everything comes from God. The psalm says what the people were to do, to come and let us bless the Lord our God. To be in worship, to bless God, means that we are here to revere God, to adore God, to praise God, and to thank God Almighty. Our worship acknowledges God for who God is and for what God has done. 
but we are not just to acknowledge what God has done and who God is. But we need to go one step further by voicing this from the very depths of our souls, giving our thanks and praise, our respect to the God who created the universe, heaven and earth, and all that we know and everything that we don't know, which is a ton. As Christians, we're to voice our praise for the gift God has given us in Jesus Christ who covered all of our sins and brought each of us for a price. The supreme act of love, death on the cross. Matthew Poole, a biblical scholar, says this about our practice of worship. Do not stand like statues, silent and idle, but employ your hearts, your tongues, in singing praise to the Lord. Matt Erickson in preaching today, August 2020, says, praising God is both seeing and saying who God is. We are to see and speak God's greatness. This is important because it's one thing we know something about. Excuse me. It is one thing to know something about God in our head. And I'm going to interject here in a minute right now. All of us know about Napoleon Bonaparte, right? Never heard of Napoleon Bonaparte? Okay. Do we know Napoleon Bonaparte? No, we don't know him. We know what we read in a book, but we don't know him. The point of worship is to come and know God. It is quite another thing to stay out loud. God has been merciful to me, and I can count the ways he has been gracious to me. Until we give voice to it and praise, it has not reached its fullness. When we come with others and we open our mouths and say, God is good and I've experienced it, it is a powerful moment. When we gather with others and raise our voice in song and we praise him, there's something very powerful that happens. This is a significant part of our spiritual journey with God, to see who God is and to say who God is. Behold, now is the time to see who God is and to say who God is, so that all might hear and know. End of quote. There is another important element of this psalm. The pilgrims, those who traveled to Jerusalem, to the temple, made lifting their hands in worship part of their worshiping God along with the priests. The command was to lift their hands in worship. Now, we Methodists have become very reserved, very reserved in our worship. It's rare to see lifted hands. And yet, with this technology today, we got words on the screen. We no longer have to hold our hymnals and let our hands just hang at our sides. Well, ain't it true? Right. An expression of heartfelt worship comes when we lift our hands, putting palms up. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be in worship if we raised our hands? What would happen if we lifted our hands, palms upward, when we sang or said the creed or we prayed? Now, if you're just a little bit leery about this, we usually put our heads down and close our eyes when we pray. Nobody on earth is going to know you got your hands up. So you can try it and see what happens. When we raise our hands in worship, we are acknowledging who God is. We're saying God is worthy of our praise and honor. Lifting our hands is an expression of praise. It's also an expression of saying, I need you, God. So when we raise our hands, we are rendering ourselves to God in his mercy. Now here's another part that's important. When we lift our palms, we show that we are open to God's will. Open to God's will. That means we're not in charge of our lives, that we seek God's will for our lives all the time. 
Granted, lifting our hands can be a scary thing if we're not sure we want to surrender our whole lives to God and God's will, no matter what it might be. Yet nothing is more fulfilling in all of life than rendering our lives to God. Because, folks, we don't live here forever. We're here for one purpose, it's to know and love God and to serve and love our neighbors in spite of whatever's going on. Raising our hands in worship is not new. A couple thousand years back, we just read about the call to raise hands in worship comes from the voices of the people who ascended to the temple in Jerusalem. After their long journey, they raised their hands in worship. The pilgrims would call out to the priests and the Levites who served in the temple day and night, called out to them saying, Come, lead us in worship. Come, bless the Lord. All you saints of the Lord who minister by night in the house of the Lord, lift your hands in the holy place and bless the Lord. It is no longer just in the temple where God dwells. The temple's not been rebuilt. God dwells in his people. When we gather as God's people, we are new spiritual houses of the Lord. We are God's temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 2.5 says, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Friends, God's putting together living stones, a spiritual house of praise and blessings and worship as we gather. Even those that see us online, God is with you. We are a temple where heartfelt worship and praise flows with our hands lifted up to the Lord God Almighty. God is blessing all who draw near to him. Now, I want to say a bit about this. This does not mean that everything that we want, we're going to get. If you want that pink Cadillac or that ranch in Montana or whatever it might be, that's not what it means. In reality, I want to ask you this question. Can you think of anything greater in all of life than to have the blessing of God upon you? Is there anything greater? There can't be because there's nothing greater than God. So to have God's great blessing upon us, there's nothing greater. And God blesses all who draw near and worship. We are called to bless the Lord our God, to adore God, to thank God, to reverence God Almighty, for God is worthy. God sustains the world, the universe, everything we know, and tons of stuff we don't. God gives us good things, and God keeps the world turning. Even in the darkest times, there is still God's goodness. The wildflower will bloom, drinking in the sunlight, in soil, where a war has been fought. Birds sing after a disaster. Praise God, all you servants of the Lord. The most amazing and glorious thing is that God responds to our worship by blessing us. The blessing of God is upon us. Eugene Peterson, who translated in modern language the, the Bible, says, Psalm 134, verse 3, describes what God does to us and among us. He enters into covenant with us. He pours out his life for us. He shares the goodness of his spirit and the vitality of his creation, the joy of his redemption. He empties himself among us, and we get what he is as he blesses us. End of quote. The very act of praising God is a blessing in itself. God promises to add his blessing to us. Our whole lives are meant to be an act of worship. 
Every thought, every word, every action as a Christian means we are called to live a life that brings praise and honor to God. Now that's a tough one, isn't it? It's like the the Beatitudes, they're tough. But guess what? We have the Holy Spirit that comes upon us and gives us what we need, corrects us, guides us, and sustains us as we seek to honor God with our lives. Could you imagine what our world would be like if we all sought to honor God with our lives? What a world we would have heaven on earth, wouldn't we? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Judson Cronwell in Leadership Magazine states, Worship helps us to find who we are and why God has placed us here on this earth. When we bow in God's presence with worship, only then are we made complete. End of worship. Our doxology that we sing every Sunday states it all. When we sing these words of praise and worship, we acknowledge that we are being blessed by God. Even when we think things can't be, get any worse and we feel that our life can't get any better, we can sing. We can sing the praises of God. We don't praise God because of the bad things that are happening. We praise God in those circumstances. There's a big difference. We are never to give thanks for the evil and the bad that's coming. But what we pray for is to God to carry us through and guide us and bring good where there is evil. Pray the Psalms. We are reminded that if we would only take the time and count our blessings, we would see that God has not left us no matter what our circumstances are. God is always with us. Now I'm going to share the words that we sing every Sunday, but I hope you'll hear them maybe a little differently. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. What if we lifted our hands when we sing that every Sunday, what would happen? You know, I bet you can't guess how old that the words to that doxology are. I bet you can't guess. It's older than John Wesley. Try 1674. That's a way back. And it was written by an Englishman named Thomas Ken. And he wrote that when we didn't even have hymns yet. He wrote it to be spoken as part of the worship services. And he used Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So, church, we need to worship God Almighty in Jesus Christ. We need to gather for worship. We need to see and stay, say who God is. We need to lift our hands in praise and be open to the blessing God has and will bestow upon us as we gather here. Let us pray. Almighty and most gracious and loving God, we pray that you put upon our hearts a desire to worship you in ways that we have never done before, that we may draw closer to you, and that we may love you and serve you all the days of our lives. We thank you for always being present with us. We thank you for blessing us even when we turn away. We are so thankful for you, Lord God Almighty. Amen.